Welcome to our second lecture in which we'll be covering Chapter 7, which is the chapter entitled Legality in Contracts. I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes going over where we've already journeyed in this particular chapter. So let's begin. Um, we started the chapter talking about what legality is and the fact that every contract needs a legal purpose and a legal subject matter. And then we talked about the fact that contracts can violate a statute or they can violate public policy. And that generally contracts that do either are going to um, uh, be void or voidable. We talked about these particular categories. We talked about usury laws, which are um, laws in which a lawfully high rate of interest is charged. We talked about wagering and gambling laws. We talked about blue and Sabbath laws, which are actually the same thing. And then we talked about licensing laws where somebody doesn't have the license that they're supposed to have what happens in those contracts. And then we went in to talk about public policy issues. As we talked about, most of these issues actually um, in Texas are also statutory issues. So the distinction that the textbook made is not completely relevant to our circumstances. Um, and so we talked about surrogacy and we talked about uh, what, sh what happens when there are contracts relating to frozen embryos or sperm donations. And we, I pointed you to the various statutes in these areas. And now we're ready to talk about premarital or prenuptial agreements and palimony type agreements. So here's our definition from the textbook of what a prenuptial agreement is. And of course, in Texas, we don't happen to use that term. We refer to it as a premarital agreement. But uh, obviously, it's the same thing. It's just a different terminology for that. So what is the nature of that agreement? Well, it's an agreement between two independent persons prior to marriage that set forth the terms and conditions of the division of property when the marriage ends, either through divorce or through death. And um, generally speaking, in Texas, we do permit premarital agreements, um, but we have some limitations. It's a fairly regulated area. For one thing, it is a, something that requires a writing. We'll talk more about that in the statute of frauds chapter. And generally speaking, it needs to be fair and reasonable. And there needs to be full disclosure between the parties. Obviously, it's not going to be very fair or reasonable if one party is withholding information. Um, generally speaking, palimony type agreements are not going to be enforceable in Texas. Uh, what is the nature of a palimony agreement? Well, it's actually an expression that arose kind of colloquially in the 1970s. There was a big case, Lee Marvin and his uh, uh, romantic partner for some period of time, Michelle Triola Marvin, um, had a relationship, or at least Michelle uh, Triola Mar Marvin claimed that they had a relationship where he basically agreed that he would take care of her um, if she remained with him, you know, take care of her from a financial perspective. Uh, they both agreed that they were not legally married, and so her argument was, even though there was no marriage, she should be entitled to something like alimony um, after the ending of the relationship. Of course, Mr. Marvin uh, disagreed with that analysis. Anyway, the courts in California ultimately held up the concept of palimony, um, even though I don't know that Mrs. Mar Mrs. Uh, Marvin actually got any money out of the arrangement. The important things to keep in mind, you can see it starts with the word pal, kind of like uh, they're not husband and wife, they're pals, I guess romantic pals. Um, generally speaking, historically, these were non enforceable agreements. They were considered meretricious agreements, meaning they were inherently immoral and therefore violated public policy. In other words, people who were having intimate uh, relationships ought to be married. And so, by per enforcing these types of agreements, the argument was that they were um, encouraging people to engage in immoral behavior when in, instead the, in, the individual should marry each other. Anyway, um, these are generally not enforceable in Texas. Um, now certainly you could have a situation in which um, two people who are romantically involved have a roommate type relationship where they have an agreement about how they are going to um, handle um, expenses and so they could enter into some kind of contract like that, but it wouldn't be um, a, uh, a romantic type 
uh, commitment or, or that, that it would be just acknowledged as the, the financial arrangements of roommates. So uh, for this reason, generally speaking, palimony type agreements are not going to be enforceable. The argument in Texas would be, well, if people want something like alimony or to have some kind of division, we've got a process for that. We have something called marriage. And that is the way to tap into these types of benefits. Uh, California no longer had a common law marriage. Uh, Texas, uh, we have something called informal marriage, which is our statutory variation on common law marriage. And many times circumstances in which people um, have a, a lengthy cohabitation where there are financial promises being made uh, may be getting pretty close to the line for informal marriage in any event. So anyway, it's a complicated issue, more appropriate for a family law class than, than what we're doing here. But I wanted to introduce the topic at this point. And let's move on to the next one. Um, it's, of course, perfectly lawful and encouraged that people would donate um, body organs, bone marrow, blood, uh, things like that, so that another person can be healthy. However, the sale of those parts is illegal, and it is oftentimes a criminal uh, issue when it arises. Um, there can be arrangements wherein people pay the medical expenses of the person making the donation, but there can't be a profit aspect to that, um, and that's a matter of, well, let me just show you the statute in Texas for that. Here we go. Um, we're in the penal code section. Uh, this is the prohibition on purchase and sale of human fetal tissue. We have the prohibition of the cell, uh, purchase and sale of human organs. You can see it's design, defi defined, of course, we're talking about humans, we're not talking about animals here. Kidneys, livers, hearts, lungs, pancreas, eye, bone, skin, or any other human organ or tissue, tissue but does not include hair or blood or blood components such as plasma. Um, and so uh, those are just kind of an overview. This is actually criminal behavior. This is pretty standard. Uh, states do usually uh, make this type of behavior unlawful. And so again, it violates public policy, but it probably more directly violates a statute. Here's just a picture of a kidney, kind of showing you what's going on inside. Obviously, we each have two kidneys if we're healthy. And so um, unlike some of those other organs that if you were to say, you know, donate your heart, you're not going to be alive at the end of the procedure. Well, if you donate a kidney, uh, you can continue to live um, with just having one kidney in most cases. So uh, this is, I guess, the kidney is, is the area, and, and bone marrow also being another area where um, it is possible to consider having a market for it, even though, of course, that's unlawful. Okay, so now we're up to covenants not to compete. Let me go back to our list of what topics we're covering here. So at this point, we've talked about uh, surrogacy, generally speaking, legal but regulated in Texas, uh, frozen embryos and sperm, sperm donations, legal and yet regulated, uh, prenuptial agreements, legal and regulate, regulated, palimony, generally not legal, uh, human organs and bone marrow, generally not legal. So we're down to two remaining categories, non-competes and exculpatory clauses. Non-competes are a fairly complex subject, so I'm going to save that for last and go ahead and talk about exculpatory, so we're going to flip to this last topic. Here we go. Um, so what is an exculpatory clause? Let's first of all look at the word exculpatory. This part right here is just making this word into an adjective. So let's look here. We have culp. Uh, for those of y'all of the Christian faith, you may be familiar with the expression mea culpa. Well, actually, you don't have to be a member of the Christian faith to be familiar with this term. This is a Latin term that was traditionally used when people would make confession in church. Um, mea culpa, my fault. In other words, they were seeking forgiveness. And so you can see in the, the culpa, the root for culp. So fault is the idea with culp. And exculpatory, this means ex or out of fault. So um, this means this is a clause that 
removes culpability, removes fault in a situation. Um, somebody has fault, but this clause in the contract is going to remove them from the consequences of their fault. Uh, let me draw an analogy. You've perhaps heard of the expression exculpatory evidence in a criminal case, for example. Well, exculpatory evidence would be evidence that tended to indicate that Bob isn't guilty of the crime to which he is charged. Um, inculpatory evidence would be evidence that would tend to indicate Bob is guilty of the crime to which he is charged. So that's a little history about this term so you can hopefully when you see it break it down and recognize the components and that can help you remember exactly what it means. Okay so a this is a clause in a contract that excuses a party from liability even though he or she has committed a wrongful act. And these, these aren't clauses in contracts, and in fact, generally speaking, they're not enforceable at all, but you can see that they have an exculpatory nature here. Notice, all persons using this facility do so at their own risk. Owners, management, employees are not responsible for accidents. Notice, we are not responsible for theft or damage to vehicles or contents. Park at your own risk. A lot of times you'll see this one on the back of a truck. Warning, stay back 200 feet, not responsible for broken windshields. And you can see all these are saying, even if something bad happens on our property, it's your problem, not ours. As I said before, these signs are usually not legally effective. Um, and that's true, but it depends partially on what you mean by legally effective. When people see these signs, many times they do believe that they're effective, and so they may be less likely to make a claim against the company. So in some sense, even though a court of law would not take these very seriously, um, the individual who might have been interested in filing a claim might. So they still do perform a function, even if they're a little bit of a, uh, maybe not the most ethical of, of uh, aspects. So when courts are faced with an exculpatory clause in a contract, they have to decide whether they're going to apply that clause or not. Um, there's a pretty significant uh, resistance sometimes for courts enforcing these particular provisions. And the things that the courts are going to ask before they uh, apply those provisions would be, did the parties have equal bargaining power? If one party, the party who's getting the exculpatory clause, had dramatically more power than the other party, that might be a reason that the court says, no, we're not going to enforce this clause. Also, the court would look at, well, how uh, lopsided is the contract overall? And how lopsided does this particular clause cause the overall contract to be? You know, if it's just kind of unfair or perhaps it's even fair, um, the courts are going to enforce it. But when it starts feeling really, really lopsided, really, really unfair, that's when the courts might start thinking, hey, this seems unconscionable. This seems inappropriate. We're not going to enforce the agreement under these circumstances. Um, let me give you an example of how an exculpatory clause works. Let's say that I run a dry cleaners and um, Bob, or we'll say Barbara comes in, she is getting married and she wants me to dry clean her dress. It's an heirloom dress, very fragile a lace, needs, a, some, needs a repair work, and some of it is yellowed with age. So it's going to require a significant investment, a lot of careful attention to get this dress back in good, good repair. Um, some of the more harsh dry cleaning chemicals might actually damage the dress too much. So it's, it's not an everyday dry cleaning type thing. Um, the dress maybe is, is market value might be $2,000. And so she, uh, Bar Barbara comes in and wants me to dry clean it. I inspect it. I say, well, listen, I will dry clean it, try my best to fix some of the yellowing and repair some of the lace. Um, that's going to be $200. Barbara says, okay. I present Barbara with a contract. She reviews the contract. It's you know, three, four or five pages long. She signs it. She surrenders the dress. And I start the process of preparing it. Uh, preparing to clean the dress. Um, I do it, but you know what? It was more fragile than I thought, and it just really wasn't possible to get the yellowing stains out, and honestly, the very fragile lace uh, doesn't look very good after the cleaning process has happened. When Barbara comes to pick it up a few days before her wedding, she's very upset. She does see things that does not look okay, and she doesn't uh, uh, feel like it's uh, that, we, that I did an acceptable job. She wants to sue me for the $1,000, the 
uh, amount of money it will take her to buy an equivalent dress. Um, and uh, then I point her to the contract. And on the, uh, we'll say the fourth page of the contract, there's an exculpatory clause. And it says that um, the most that Barbara can sue me for is the uh, price that she was going to pay for the service being offered. So she can sue me for $200, but she can't sue me for more than that particular price. Even though if the dress truly is unwearable, she is actually at $1,000 instead of $200. Um, I think under those circumstances, the court would probably enforce that agreement. Let's look at this from the circumstances. First of all, let's assume in this community there's lots of dry cleaners that are able to uh, care for this type of dress. Let's assume that my price that I am charging for it is pretty typical of the industry. And let's say that these types of clauses are common in this industry as well. Um, if I, when I um, am only able or only expected to get $200 out of a service and I perform the service to my best of my abilities or at least to a reasonable degree and I might have to end up paying five times as much as my best case scenario would be, you can see how that's really going to be economically very difficult for me to manage. And I'm probably over the long haul going to have to raise my fees because, you know, probably 10% of the time or maybe five or 10% of the time, the dress really doesn't handle the, the dry cleaning process that well. And so it would be pretty common for me to have to pay out large amounts. So that means I'm gonna have to charge each one of the customers quite a bit more. Um, and so under those circumstances, I think that the court might say, you know what, this exculpatory clause seems reasonable. Um, she, uh, the dry cleaner was gonna get $200 if it worked out well, she's gonna pay $200 if it doesn't work out well. That seems reasonable. But let's imagine a different scenario, same facts, but this time the exculpatory clause was only $5. The most that Barbara could successfully sue me for would be $5. I think according to those circumstances, even with equal bargaining power, would probably conclude that this is probably an offensive and oppressive contract. It really doesn't motivate me to be very careful in how I uh, take care of the dress and prepare the dress. And so I think under those circumstances, a $5 um, exculpatory clause when the overall uh, uh, value of the service that I'm providing is supposedly $200, um, a court might well conclude that that is um, um, unconscionable and not enforce that provision. So if the co court decided not to enforce an exculpatory clause, it could cut the entire clause out and so therefore Barbara would be entitled to um, whatever the court ruled was her true damages, which in this case might be $1,000, um, perhaps even more than that, who knows. Alternatively, the court could uh, change or reform, form again, in other words, the particular clause and maybe actually move the, uh, the amount up to $200 or $300 or something along those lines to address the issue. So the things to keep in mind is that sculptory clauses are not automatically unenforceable, but they do require uh, a careful consideration of uh, whether the court is going to enforce it. And so it, it's meritorious, it's a good idea to not, e even if you are the person who's gonna benefit from the exculpatory clause, to not make it excessively one-sided so that um, the court may be tempted not to enforce it. So I'm gonna go back and talk about non-competes now. Ah, oh, here we go. Okay, well, <laughs> most of the time when we talk about public policy issues, um, we discover that what the public policy of the citizens of state X is, is likely to be largely the sub same public policy that exists in state Y or state Q or state M. I mean, you know, people are people and um, there's usually not a lot of differences between how people in one state view a subject versus people in another state. Um, the one area that, that we're gonna talk about in this case that doesn't fit that paradigm is the area of non-competes. We see a lot of difference in how states handle this matter. Um, we have a, an outlier over here, the state of California, that has as its public policy, it's actually in its constitution, it does not permit any non-competes, no matter how reasonable or even-handed they're supposedly. On the other end, we have states like Kansas and Missouri and to some extent, um, Connecticut, 
maybe the Kandika might be a little bit more uh, here. And in these states, while not every single non-compete is going to be enforceable, certainly the courts have been uh, significantly predisposed to want to enforce the non-competes. Um, and so you have really two extremes. I mean, are people in Connecticut and Kansas and Missouri fundamentally different than people in California? I don't know. It's kind of an interesting issue. Uh, before we go too much into this, let's first of all talk about what is a non-compete. And we have a definition and we can see that we really have a, a, a term here and then we have um, a couple of synonyms. It's sometimes it's called a covenant not to compete. In this context, a covenant is basically meaning a contract. It can also be called a non-competition agreement and a restrictive covenant. But I'll tell you the most common term for it is a non-compete. Uh, you could say it's a non-compete. I'm sorry, it should be an in here. <laughs> non-compete contract, but usually people just say non-competes. So in, certainly in the professional uh, areas, that's what it's termed. So here's what it is. A provision in a contract. So usually the non-competitive language is not the whole agreement. And in fact, it can't be in Texas, although some of these other states it may be. So we're talking about a piece of a larger document. So it's a provision or a clause in a contract that restricts a party's ability to compete. And they typically arise in two areas. One is in employment. I have an employee. I don't want them, that employee to go to work for a competitor. So I want to restrict their ability to work for that competitor. That would be the employment circumstance. My restriction might apply during their employment with me or that might apply even after they leave my employment. Another situation is typically at the sale of a business. It can be more broad than that, but that's the traditional example. I own a taco restaurant. It's very popular. It's in a strip center, have a pretty strong following. It's called Groover's Tacos. Um, Bob buys my Groover's Taco restaurant from me. You know, he buys the cash register, the pots and pans, the tables, all of those things, but he's also buying my goodwill. He actually pays more than all the stuff he's acquiring. Anyway, so he, when he opens the restaurant the first day as his own restaurant, he may have even chosen to keep the name the same, Groover's Tacos. He's hoping that some of, of my loyal customers will go, go into the restaurant and give the restaurant a, a chance uh, to meet their needs, even though I am no longer there. He may even hope that no one notices that um, it's under new management. So the first day he's open, he finds he does pretty good business. He may well have even retained many of my employees. The second day, it's also doing pretty good business. But on the third day, when he arrives to unlock his restaurant, he sees that the open uh, spot in the strip mall is now has a sign above it. And it says, Groover's Better Tacos. And he realizes that I have just opened a competing taco stand just two stores down from his. And by the time um, he, he opens for lunch, he sees he has actually very few customers inside, but there's a long line out the door in front of Groover's Better Tacos. And from that day forward, he has uh, not very much business, but my, he can see that my business is very, very strong. And so he concludes, probably reasonably, that my loyal customers, the customers that had uh, frequented my restaurant, have now moved en masse to my new restaurant. And so he is not truly getting the advantage of my goodwill. I've essentially retained it by opening a competing restaurant in this same area. So what Bob probably should have done in those circumstances is when he purchased my restaurant, he should have had a non-compete in there. It should have said, you know, Groover can't open a restaurant or at least not a taco restaurant maybe within a 25 mile radius of this particular location. And that way I couldn't open a competitor and so he would be able to uh, continue to benefit from the name recognition and the location familiarity that people had. So you can see how it's useful both in the employment context and the business, uh, sell of business context. So you may be thinking, well, why does California prohibit this? Um, there's a few reasons. One of them is that non-competes can be very unfair. Uh, 
usually not so much in the sell of business situation, but in the employment situation. Let me give you an example. Imagine that I am a hairstylist. I have just graduated from a beautician school and I am starting my first job cutting hair. I go to work for Bob's Hair Salon. Um, when I go there the first day, I don't have a following. I don't have a list of customers. The people whom I cut their hair, they're walk-in customers, or maybe their usual stylist is off that day. Um, but as I cut their hair, um, I develop a relationship with them, and I try to persuade them to see me as a regular stylist. Um, I'm pretty successful at this, so I go from having zero customers to after about three years here, I have a, a following what is called a book of about 100 clients. That's a pretty good sized book, especially for somebody at this point in my career. Um, I decide, you know what, um, I'm currently only getting to keep 50% of whatever I um, collect from my uh, style from my customer so if the style if the customer you know had a $30 uh, fee I'm um, only keeping $15 plus my tip and Bob is keeping the other $15 but I've seen that there's a salon a few miles away that allows its stylist to keep 60% so that would be a significantly higher amount in my pocket you know, I'm a little concerned about moving locations because I recognize that a few of my customers probably won't follow me to the new salon. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm kind of balancing losing a few customers to being able to keep a higher percentage of my money. But I've thought about it and I've decided that I'm ready to take the leap. And so I do. I um, transfer my, I resign from Bob's salon and I go to work, we'll say it's Larry's salon. And so now I'm cutting hair there. And I've contacted my, my customers, letting them know that this is where to find me. And uh, most do follow me. And I do ultimately find that my sales rebound. I get more customers in this new location as well. And so it was a good financial move. Uh, generally speaking, um, what are Bob's interests in this situation? Well, one thing that Bob might have said when I was resigning is he might have said, okay, I'm going to miss you, but I understand you want to move on to another opportunity. I respect that. But, you know, um, those customers that you have been assisting, those aren't your customers. They're my customers. Um, the vast majority of them are people who came to my salon. Now, you cut their hair. I agree with that. And you developed a good relationship. But you were acting as my employee in that situation. They didn't come here the first time to get you to do their hair. They came here because of Bob's a salon's good reputation and they saw you as an employee as in fact you were an employee of mine so those 100 customers who routinely get their hair done with, by you they those uh, those list of customers belong to me not to you and so I, I expect that you will not contact them uh, because this is a customer list that belongs to me Bob salon and not to you as you can imagine, I see it differently. You, Bob, you weren't cutting their hair. Um, I consider them my customers. And so Bob may make the argument that I can't take that, that information with me. Of course, I'm probably clever enough that I have gotten that information, taken it home with me long before the day that I resign. And so at that moment, even if Bob insists that uh, all of my customer data stays with him, um, I probably still have another copy at home. So it's probably not the most effective way for Bob to protect that interest. So after this experience, Bob hires Sally, also from beauty school, maybe even to replace me. But now Bob has been burned. He, he saw all, most of those customers that I had had developed leave his salon and go and follow me to the new salon. And so he vows that he's not gonna be in that situation again. So on Sally's uh, second day working, he presents her with a non-compete. He says, listen, Sally, um, I hope that you are tremendously successful here. I'm going to do everything I can to assist you to be successful. Uh, but, I, but if you want to work here, you're going to have to sign a non-compete. Um, you're going to have to, um, you, you, you cannot work for a competition while you work for me or for up to a year after you leave my employ. And the, the geographic range of this non-compete, we'll say, is 25 miles. And the subject matter 
would be that you cannot um, uh, do hair services such as trims, cuts, dyes, perms, straighteners, um, anything relating to hair. And so Sally says, well, uh, I'd prefer not to sign it, but I need this job, and so I'm going to go ahead and sign it. So she signs it. There's also a provision in the agreement that um, uh, Bob is going to provide Sally with specialized training in how to um, uh, do uh, various hair techniques, uh, training that, that Sally had not yet had. So that's the consideration that Bob is giving to Sally under these circumstances. So Sally works there for three more years. She's also quite successful, and she has a following now of about 100 customers. Um, Sally uh, is a little bit frustrated by the fact she only keeps half of the money, and she knows that lots of competing salons allow their stylists to keep 60 or even 65% of the um, uh, uh, receipts that are received by uh, uh, the salon. So Sally decides to kind of look out and see what's out there. Um, she goes to Teresa's salon and she likes it. It's attractive, it's in a nice part of town, it's going to be appealing to her customer base. Um, Teresa seems nice, the receptionist seems nice. So she's decided um, that she's going to go over to Teresa's uh, salon. So she comes and tells Bob, hey Bob, I'm resigning. Um, he may, she may not tell Bob about Teresa, but it's a small enough community that Bob soon finds out that uh, Sally is doing hair at Teresa's, which is, Teresa's salon is only three miles away. Well, Bob says, hey, Sally, you're violating your non-compete. I, I, I can't stop you from uh, your decision to resign from your employment with me, but I can stop you from working with a competitor, and you are doing hair there and it's within the 25 mile radius and so um, I am sending you a cease and desist letter I'm also giving it to Teresa when Teresa sees that letter she's going to think to herself wow I mean Sally's a good employee but I don't have the resources to hire attorneys and fight this I'm just going to have to fire Sally because I can't afford this hassle and so now Sally is unemployed and so it's going to be hard for her to get another styling position um, as long as this non-compete is in, an, in effect. And if she waits a year and one day, most of her 100 clients will have moved on to other stylists because you know, they will have needed to get their hair cut in the interim. So Sally is in a real pickle. Okay, so let's go ahead. After Sally's quit, Bob hires um, uh, Ted to be a new stylist. He's also straight from beauty school. Uh, Bob has Ted sign the non-compete and uh, provides Ted that training and has the same provisions in it. Uh, Ted also is quite successful two or three years in. He also has a following of about 100 uh, customers. Bob has shared with Ted that he really doesn't enforce his non-compete and so uh, Ted should not be thinking about working for a competitor. Um, he's, uh, Ted is, Bob has even shared the story of Sally with Ted, so Ted knows that Bob is to be taken seriously. Bob's okay, excuse me, Ted is okay with this arrangement. He'd like to earn more money, but you know, he's doing okay. So um, three years into it, Bob sits down with Ted and tells Ted that, you know, Ted, you're doing a good job, but he's gonna need to change the terms of employment. And Bob is, instead of collecting 50% of the receipts, Bob is now going to collect 60% of the receipts, and Ted will get the remaining 40% plus tips. This is a pretty significant financial hit for Bob, I'm assuming for Ted. Ted's pretty mad about it. He goes, you can't do this. This isn't fair. The, the our agreement was 50-50. And Bob said, well, you know, I, I, you're employed at will, so uh, you don't have to accept these terms. You can resign at any time. Well, Ted says, well, I can't really because if I resign, I can't work for a competitor. You're the only place I can work for in town. And Bob says, you're right about that. If you want to do hair, you're going to have to work for me. So Ted sucks it up and says, okay, I'm going to stay here, even though my pay has dramatically been cut. A couple years later, Bob comes back to Ted and says, you know what? I'm now going to claim 70% of your, your, uh, the receipts that you generate. Now Ted is saying, wait a second, I can't live off that sum of money. 
And Bob says, you know what? You signed the non-compete. That was your decision. You don't have to stay here, but you can't work for a competitor. And so you can see how a non-compete can be used as a weapon that can keep an employee employed um, even if it's not financially advantageous for the employee. Because again, the employer is essentially has a monopoly. If the employee wants to stay in this industry and in this geographic area, the employee has to stay working with the employer. So those are some of the concerns that states like California has ha have had about it. So where is Texas on this line? We're pretty much in the middle. If, if, we, if I had been offering this course um, we'll say 15 years ago, I probably would have put Texas not all the way to California for sure, but much closer to California than the other extreme. Nowadays, but there's definitely been a shift towards um, the more enforceability. So I'm going to put maybe at about here. But again, it's, it's somewhat in flux. Uh, we have a statute which I'll show you in a second. The statute hasn't changed. It's how the Texas Supreme Court has interpreted the statute that's changed. Um, so the bottom line is in Texas, non-competes can be enforceable, but they are, they are given significantly more scrutiny than other states give them. Now, whatever state you're looking at, with the exception of California, even the Missouri, Kansas, and Connecticut states, um, you'll find that there's going to be a review of three aspects of the agreement. First of all, is the geographical area reasonable? Going back to my salon example, the reality is most people don't, won't travel more than say 25 miles to go get their hair cut. If it's farther than that, they'll just get a new stylist. And so if we were to have a geographic restriction that was the whole United States, that would be unreasonable. Uh, Ted ought to be able to move from Houston, or excuse me, from Dallas to Houston and restart his career as a stylist if he wanted to, uh, because the odds of any one of his 100 customers actually following him to Houston is very, very small. So it has to be reasonable, it has to reflect what's going on in this particular market, in this particular industry. There also has to be a reasonable time period. Oftentimes, uh, again, for the salon industry, usually this is 25 miles, but some, uh, some, areas, let me just talk, so, some um, industries that will be significantly broader, it can even be worldwide. For example, if it's a high tech type industry, I mean, technology works the same way any place on the globe. So um, in those situations, you're much more likely to see a, uh, a gl global type restriction which aren't always enforceable in other countries, but that's neither here nor there for the purpose of drafting the contract. Um, if this person it has a non-compete, this person is a, a salesperson, usually courts will find that the geographical area of this person's sales territory is a reasonable level. So if the person has the states of Texas, Oklahoma, and New Mexico, that would probably be a reasonable geographic area for the restriction. If on the other hand, the um, employee had the Dallas-Fort Worth market as his or her sales territory, and the, the geographic restriction in the, in the non-compete was the whole state of Texas, very possibly the court would find that that was unreasonable. Although the court could consider additional information, perhaps even though this particular salesperson only was responsible for the Dallas-Fort Worth market, he had data, he, was, he had available data to him for the whole state of Texas that might cause the whole state to be a reasonable geographic area. The time period is going to vary um, depending again, upon the industry. Uh, two years is generally considered reasonable. There have been ones that have been longer than that that have been held to be enforceable. Um, if, again, if it's a stylist situation, two years is probably on the high side, again, because people are going to need to get their hair cut more than every couple of years. There could be some industries where it's longer, though. Let's say that you are a, a John Deere tractor salesperson. Well, farmers don't buy, you know, two tractors a year. Um, it, most likely they only buy a tractor every few years. And so you can see how, because these are big purchases that don't happen very often, you would need a longer period of, of um, enforcement in order for it to really protect the interest that you're trying to protect. So this is going to vary. In the high-tech industry, usually the time period can actually be shorter because whatever special technology you knew today, that data or that knowledge will, would probably be pretty dated even a year or two or three down the road.
And then finally, we look to the reasonableness of the restraint of trade. So going back to the example, Ted was a stylist. He had never done nails. He had never been a masseuse, masseur. Um, he had skills relating to hair. So it would be reasonable to restrict him out of hair jobs, but if he wanted to go into mas becoming a masseur or being a nail tech, I think it's pretty reasonable to say that he could be able to change industries. He certainly could lead, could leave uh, the uh, beauty products and beauty services industry. So let's say he became a chef. Well, um, there's just no overlap between doing hair and being a chef. And so a restriction that restricted him out of any job or jobs in other industries would clearly be unreasonable. Okay, so these are the things that we're going to be looking for, or the court's going to be looking for to see if they're enforceable. You don't want to over, if you're representing the employer, you don't want to over grab in this area and have very, very onerous limitations on the employee because, again, the court is very likely to say, well, I'm not going to enforce anything then. And so your, your client gets nothing when he could have got, if he had been more, less greedy, he could have gotten a pretty reasonable uh, non-compete that would have met his business needs that would have been enforceable. So here is the statute or really an excerpt from the statute. A covenant not to compete is enforceable if it is ancillary to or part of an otherwise enforceable agreement. We'll talk more about this in a second. I'm just going to pull asterisk here. At the time the agreement is made to the extent it contains limitations as to time, geographic area, and scope of activity to be restrained that are reasonable. Look, these are exactly the three things we saw on this slide, right? Um, and do not impose a greater restraint than is necessary to protect the goodwill or other business interests of the promisee. So again, here we're looking at what interest does the uh, does Bob, the salon owner, have? His interest is is not, it's not an appropriate interest for him to get as much labor for as cheap as price as possible. His interest, and it's a reasonable interest, is in keeping his customers because the law would say that those 100 customers that Sally and I and Ted generated were really Bob's customers. And so um, his interest in maintaining those customers, that's a legitimate goodwill business interest thing. So the types of interests that businesses have is to keep customer lists secure, to keep processes, uh, uh, business plans, uh, technological innovations, all of that secret. Um, it shouldn't, uh, bus a legitimate business goal is not to oppress uh, one's employees. So as I said before, this is pretty standard stuff for an employment uh, for non-compete. The part that's interesting in Texas is this ancillary to or part of an otherwise enforceable agreement. So the first thing that we notice about this is that you can't have a non-compete in Texas that is just a non-compete. So uh, Bob couldn't have gone in to say to Ted, hey Ted, um, I'm going to insist that you sign this non-compete and the consideration I'm going to give you is $100. That wouldn't work because the interest that is in this otherwise enforceable agreement has to be why you're entering into the non-compete. Well, uh, the $100 that Bob is giving Ted has nothing to do with a non-compete. So typically what employers do to satisfy this requirement is give the employee access to trade secrets or specialized training. That becomes the consideration and that information is what the employer is trying to uh, keep secure. And so you want to have, you have to think carefully about what that stuff is going to be. Things like continued employment, a pay increase, none of that is going to work. And it could be a new position in which the person is receiving this confidential, highly sensitive information. But you ought to also talk about the information this person is going to have access to. This is usually, I'm going to say, you, you've, I've definitely seen non-competes tex in Texas fail because of these concerns. But this is probably the more challenging area in Texas. So hopefully uh, that makes some sense. Um, and uh, is helpful to think about. As I said before though, even though it's somewhat difficult to draft a non-compete that's effective in Texas, it's also useful to keep in mind that um, 
even if you if a person has a non-compete that is not enforceable that it is uh, too broad um, the the um, person who hires the employee with the non-compete is uh, usually not that invested in the employee and so once that new employer gets the cease and desist letter um, that new employer usually will say hey I don't even want to deal with this uh, I'm sorry but I don't want to get sued I don't want to spend all this money you're just one of many employees you're just not that important to me so you need to go and so a, a non-compete even one that's unenforceable in Texas can still sometimes be pretty effective especially if you're talking about relatively low-ranking people in an organization that's a kind of an unfortunate uh, aspect of the law in this area so at this point we have now covered all of our public policy issues we've talked about surrogacy frozen embryos and sperm donation we've talked about prenuptial agreements premarital in texas pa uh, palimony agreements these are usually not enforceable we've talked about how contracts for human organs or bone marrow are usually not enforceable we've talked about non-competes and we've talked about exculpatory clauses so we have completed the material for this particular uh, topic now we're going to talk about we because we're, uh, uh, we're going to talk about what happens when we have a contract that doesn't seem enforceable um, because there's some illegality in it so we've talked about how sometimes they will be valid or actually a contract that is lawful will generally be valid but a contract that is for an illegal purpose or has an illegal subject matter typically is either going to be void or voidable so how do we decide which one it is what's that analysis like okay um, so one thing that can happen is that if this is part of a larger contract what the court might do is just carve out the part that's unlawful and that works best if the contract itself is divisible in other words can be divided um, so let's say that I have a um, I am a, uh, a oh well, let's go back say right before prohibition started and so I I am a uh, a I have a uh, catering business and so a, a customer has secured my services I'm supposed to prepare a dinner for a catered dinner for an event and also I'm supposed to provide the liquor and the wine for an open bar we enter into this contract we establish the fee structure and then prohibition goes into effect well what the court would do is say okay you can't obviously serve the liquor and the wine at this point so we're going to sever that part of the agreement um, and reduce the price of course according to whatever the schedule is but the rest of the agreement the agreement to prepare um, the uh, the food there's nothing unlawful about that prohibition hasn't uh, stopped those services from being provided so we're going to be able to save that so most likely the court is going to find that type of contract to be divisible um, but if you had a contract for example that was just for the sale of um, alcohol uh, say beer wine and and um, liquor and maybe uh, the uh, caterer is just really just being a bar maybe they're also supposed to provide um, peanuts and popcorn as little snacky things at the bar but you know it's 99% about the, the liquor um, then prohibition comes in I think the court would say well this contract isn't divisible yes there are a few items that the restaurateur is providing that are not alcoholic that would be lawful but they really don't make sense as products unless you're also going to have the um, alcohol and so some contracts can be some contracts may not be it's really a, a fact intensive analysis it's not unusual in contracts to have a clause in the contracts contract that claims that the contract is divisible and that any parts of the contract that have to be edited out should be edited out so the rest of the deal can continue um, but again it's really left up to the court ultimately to decide whether that's possible or not so let's consider the topic of impari delicto little Latin expression this term is not in your textbook but you are responsible for knowing it so be aware of that impari delicto um, means equally at fault 
If two people enter into a contract to do something unlawful, generally speaking, the courts are going to say, you're both criminals. You're both bad people. You're equally at fault. The court isn't going to parse out liability and say, well, Bob is 55% responsible and Larry is 45% responsible. No, if they're both doing it together, the court's just going to say, you're equal. Uh, we're not going to figure out who did a little bit more, who had a little bit bigger motivation or something along those lines. Um, so the courts are just not going to enforce the contract at all. Most likely they will say that it's void under those circumstances. Of course, we talked before about especially the license situation where people aren't always in pari delicto. Let's go back here. Oh, well, let's talk about the usury situation. So um, I'm a payday lender. Uh, Bob is my customer. I charge him an, a usurious interest rate. Well, he signed the contract, but the law would not say he's in pari delicto with me. They would say, the law would say that Bob is my victim. He is a victim of the violation of the law. And so therefore, he's not in pari delicto with me. Another example would be the... Um, unlicensed performance law. Again, I pretend to be a doctor. You come to see me. You think I'm a doctor. Um, under those situations, again, I'm your, you're my victim. Um, and so you are not in pari delicto. And so it kind of depends upon the nature of the crime. But if, if it's not those circumstances, if the law that prohibits the behavior was not designed to protect one of the parties, um, in most cases, the law is going to say they're in pari delicto. But sometimes, not often, sometimes the court may say, look, we're going to really consider, even when both parties kind of did something wrong, every now and again, when it's really out of whack, where really one person seems a lot more culpable than the other, we're, we're just going to say that, that they're not in pari delicto. And the case that is oftentimes cited for this is the Liebman versus Rosenthal case. And I am pulled it up here so you can see. A little information about this case. This is a, uh, a sad case. It has a happy ending, but it's a sad case. Uh, Mr. Liebman and his family were trying to flee the Nazis during World War II. He and his family were of the Jewish faith, and they were living in France at the time. I think, especially given his surname, he probably was from Germany originally, and he had probably been moving um, moving west to escape the Nazis because he, he was aware of the fact that he would probably be killed as well as the rest of his family if the Nazis were to get him. Um, he was a man of some means. He had jewelry worth about $30,000 and he needed to get a visa so that he could get to uh, from France to Portugal. And if he would get this visa there and could get to Portugal, there was a good chance he could get to the United States and there he and his family would be safe. But as a practical matter, getting one of these visas legally was basically impossible. And so he uh, soon realized that he was going to need to get a forged visa for he and his family. Of course, hiring somebody to forge a visa is a crime. Um, and so what he was getting involved with, with was criminal behavior. Anyway, he finds Mr. Rosenthal, who is also of the Jewish faith, and, Mr. and he negotiates with Mr. Rosenthal. Mr. Rosenthal agrees to uh, have a forgery made for Mr. Lehman's family if Mr. Lehman will provide him with $30,000. Well, Mr. Lehman does provide Mr. Rosenthal with $28,000. This is the amount right here that you need to know here. You need to know $28,000. Let me just mark this for a second. So. So this amount right here, remember this. Okay, so um, he, um, he provides $28,000 to Mr. Rosenthal, and he's thinking to himself that Mr. Rosenthal will go and get, get good forgeries, and he and his family will be able to get to Portugal and then get to uh, the United States. Mr. Rosenthal, however, doesn't do that. Mr. Rosenthal just takes the money, or I guess the jewelry, and doesn't uh, get the forged documents, and in fact, vanishes. Okay, so fast forward a few years, the war is over, Mr. Rosenthal gets to uh, the United States, um, and he's walking down, uh, down a street in New York City, and Mr. Lehman is there as well. I imagine Mr. Rosenthal is pretty surprised to see Mr. Lehman. Probably Mr. Rosenthal thought that the Nazis got Mr. Lehman, but somehow or another Mr. Lehman was able to get to the United States.
Obviously, when Mr. Liebman sees Mr. Rosenthal, he's furious and he decides to sue Mr. Rosenthal to get back his $28,000 in jewelry. I mean, he won't get the jewelry back, but he might get the value of that back. Mr. Rosenthal says, basically agrees with Mr. Lehman about the facts. Yes, we entered into a contract for 30,000. Yes, Mr. Lehman gave me all these jewels worth about 28,000. Yes, I agreed in exchange for these jewels to get him forged documents that would allow him to get to Portugal. And yes, I did not do that. I breached my contract. But Mr. Rosenthal's argument is we're in pari delicto. It was illegal for me to agree to provide forged documents and it was illegal for Mr. Liebman to contract to obtain these documents. And what the law does when people are in pari delicto is he, it doesn't make one party return stuff to the other party. So it just so happens that Mr. Rosenthal has $28,000 in Mr. Liebman's original money, but the courts usually don't step in under these circumstances and make Mr. Rosenthal give back the money. But the court in this case said, hey, come on here. Listen, you're fleeing from the Nazis. Your life is at stake. You know, yes, you shouldn't go around hiring people to forge documents for you, granted. But when people's lives are at risk, um, people uh, do what they have to do. And Mr. Rosenthal is the bad guy here because he um, did not, he took the money under false pretenses and did not provide the documents. So the court said Mr. Lehman is not in pari delicto with Mr. Rosenthal and required that Mr. Rosenthal return the uh, $28,000. So that's the takeaway from, um, from the, uh, the Lehman versus Rosenthal case. Let's talk about in locus potentia. This means um, that a person might have a repentance. They might repudiate their actions or undo their actions. Um, and of course, restitution in the situation means a remedy that gets people back to where they were before. It restores them to the circumstances that they were previously in. Here we go. So an example of this could be, I might be in loco potentious. Maybe I was in pari delicto with my uh, fellow in crime, but before we actually rob the bank, I get a conscience and I um, disentangle myself from this potential criminal enterprise. Um, if I do that, I am no longer going to be considered impari delicto. Now, if I've already committed the crime, it's too late for me to um, have in locos potentia. But if I have yet to do it, I've just been preparing for it, planning for it, but not having done it, then I can claim in locos potentia. And sometimes I can be um, absolved of my status of being impari delicta. delicto. So here are some uh, provisions that you want to look out for when you are drafting contracts. You want to make sure that you, you aren't um, excluding consequential damages. This could be a situation where we have a exculpatory clause um, that is too strict, that is cutting off too many of the damages that one party might be able to have. You, had, you don't want to waive a statute of limitations generally, or at least you don't want to um, uh, waive it um, or you want to carefully consider whether you have that as part of a part, a part of a contract. You want to uh, make sure that your statement says, hey, all the representations that are relevant to this transaction are actually in the contract. So the other side can't say, but you promised me X and Y and Z. Oh no, because the actual contractual language says the only things that I promised you, the only things that you're relying upon are what in black and white in the four corners of this contract. And then again, you want to have that severability clause in it so that your contract hopefully will be treated as if it is a divisible contract. So those are some things to keep in mind as you draft to avoid the consequences of a provision in a contract that might be considered illegal. Um, if you have any questions, as always, please feel free to email me or even better, come by my office hours so we can explore these issues in more detail. I thank you for your attention and I hope you have a wonderful day.